Live from Fox 12 Oregon, this is Breaking News. And we do begin with breaking news tonight. The doors will close at three Portland elementary schools. The board made that decision just minutes ago, but changes to Jefferson High School are still up in the air. KPTV's Kevin Quarry joins us live from North Portland with more. Kevin. Right, Sean, the Portland Public School Board is still debating that issue inside the headquarters building here behind me. Now, part of the superintendent's plan did pass, but again, board members are still talking about what is perhaps the most contentious issue, and that is exactly what to do with Jefferson High School. Now, take a look at uh, some video from a little bit earlier tonight. Dozens of people showed up to voice their opinions tonight. There was heated testimony, mainly from people in the Jefferson cluster. In the end, board members voted to close Applegate, Whitaker, and Kenton Elementary Schools, but they are still talking about what is, again, a most uh, controversial plan out there. The superintendent wants to add grades to Jefferson High School, making it a 7th through 12th grade school. The citizens have already said they don't want the 7 through 12, and if they do that, they're not going to send their kids there. Certainly, you're not going to get people outside of the area to come in. Well, that was uh, one parent and teacher speaking there, and uh, many people here echoed that same sentiment. Now, part of the superintendent's plan has changed a bit. What they are voting on now in that 7th through 12th grade plan would actually be a study of the 7th through 12th grade plan. They would come back in December to vote on it ultimately. Again, that decision is expected any minute now here at the headquarters building, and of course, we'll bring it to you live coming up in this newscast. For now, live in North Portland, Kevin Kawari, the 10 o'clock news. Tonight's shock over an Easter message. Someone left Easter eggs on lawns all over Longview filled with racist literature. KPTV's Jamie Wilson talked with some people who found the eggs, and he, she joins us now live with more. Jamie? Well, all day yesterday, little kids were searching for and finding these plastic eggs in their yards. But when some adults here in Longview found these eggs, instead of candy, they were filled with racial propaganda. When Chuck Havens found four of these plastic eggs on his lawn yesterday, he thought they may be souvenirs from Easter's past. She put them out for the kids, you know, for several years, you know, and afterwards we found them in the yard for a couple of years afterwards. But when he opened them up, Chuck says he found disturbing messages, flyers like this, full of racial slurs and talk of white supremacy. Well, sure, shocked, yeah. We sure didn't expect something like that. Chuck called the police, but they already knew. Officers found dozens of eggs in front of homes and churches stuffed with racist and anti-government literature. But I saw it, and I, I thought just like she did. I thought it was a tennis ball, a yellow tennis ball. Ron and Jean Evelyn thought the yellow egg in their grass belonged to the neighbor kids. They have no idea why racist messages would be dropped off in their neighborhood, but they don't want them. It's terrible, and it's scary because people go too far. In the city, I think you see a lot more tolerance um, than perhaps you would in a small so rural town like this one. Some locals say racism can be an issue here in Longview. They just never thought it would show up in their front yard inside an Easter egg. Not to mention a religious holiday. Now, there were no threats of harm or violence inside those messages, so police say the on only real crime committed here was littering but they tell me they are going to monitor this situation. Live in Longview tonight, Jamie Wilson, the 10 o'clock news. Tonight, police are searching for a bank robber who's on the run. The robbery happened just after 5 o'clock this evening at the Wells Fargo near Washington Square Mall. Witnesses say a man walked in and showed a teller two handguns, then demanded cash. Here's what he looks like. He's white, about 45 to 50 years old. He has brown hair and a mustache. He's tall and thin, well over six feet tall, and he was wearing silver eyeglasses. If you have information, please call the FBI. In tonight's Meth Watch, burglars knock off a grocery store, killing a key, stealing a key ingredient used to make meth. Someone broke into the store in Estacada and took off with carts of the cold medicine Sudafed, and now officials need your help. KPTV's David Wilson joins us live from Clackamas tonight with more on the story. David? Yeah, detectives here say the uh, thieves stole dozens of cartons of uh, Sudafed with the likely aim of turning it into a pile of methamphetamine. With a population of just 3,000 people, the small town of Estacada is often called quiet, but locals say the mountain community has a growing drug culture. Well, what gives you that idea that it's full of drugs? Just things you hear. 
Yeah. About him running it over the mountain and whatnot. According to police, thieves broke into the Estacada Thriftway around 11 o'clock Sunday night. Clackamas deputies say the crooks entered through a back door and spent at least a half hour inside the store drilling out locks to steal money, plus cartons of cigarettes and at least 100 boxes of Sudafed. Police say it all boils down to the methamphetamine drug problem. Part of the problem is, you know, law enforcement. There's Clackamas County Sheriff's Office is spread so thin how, where can they be? Deputies say the thieves may have had a key to the back door since there was no sign of forced entry and that they answered the 911 call within four minutes, but the burglars were already gone. Tonight, locals point out that the methamphetamine problem is widespread and that the culprits may not have been from Estacada. You got to remember that we're also way out here and we get people from Portland out here. We get people from from Sandy, from every Damascus, Malala, everywhere else. So it's not just, you can't just say it's an esticated person. I really don't think that the they were from around here. They probably came out to Estacada because they thought it was a quiet town and they could get away with it. And tonight, Clackamas investigators offering a $1,000 reward for information leading to the suspect's arrest. We're live in Oregon City, David Wilson, the 10 o'clock news. A big traffic mess is finally cleared tonight on the sunset. Take a look. You may have been caught up in this backup on Highway 26 this afternoon. That's because an overturned semi forced the closure of the westbound lane near the Cornell Road exit for hours. Nobody was hurt, and ODOT says that they had the wreck cleaned up by about 7 tonight. Snow and lots of it hit the slopes of Mount Hood today. Meanwhile, here in the city, it was just all rain. We have live team coverage tonight. Mark Nelson will tell us if the recent wet weather has helped our drought situation. But first, KPTV's Jim Hyde is live at Government Hat with more Government Camp, rather, with more on the snow that's fallen all around you, Jim. Yes, it is. It's fallen all around us. Winter has waited until spring, really, to deliver what's necessary for the seasonal economy around Mount Hood. David Atkins and his mom are having more fun in a single day than many Northwesterners have had in all of this screwy ski season. After the lifts closed for the day at Timberline, they got a sled. My mom hit a jump and she went upside down and everybody was looking at her and then she just disappeared and everybody was laughing. David and his mom have come to Timberline from Daytona Beach, Florida for spring break. Good timing. In the morning, it was beautiful. The sky was blue and everything. And then when we started going down the runs, it just started snowing really hard. The snow is more than welcome at Mount Hood Meadows, too. Rain washed out any Easter Sunday skiing. Then it chilled down and dumped seven inches of snow for today's play. It's been up and down, but, you know, right now, it's really the best skiing we've had all year. So T-shirts are 50% off. Half price on underused demo gear is a good deal for some. Some more snow before summer is an important factor for all who make a home and a living around here. They have to have snow in the Palmer for the business in the summer. In the summer times when we pay our bills anyway, you know. There's more people here every day, seven days a week. You can't snowboard on rain, nor shine. So all the snow on this day and the week ahead is brightening spirits in government camp. Oh, I just, me and my friend Tanner up here set it up. Let's have a little jib sesh. It's pretty sick. Now Mark Nelson's going to tell them more about when and how much snow, but the folks around government camp and the Mount Hood communities are expecting this to go on and maybe on and on and on, looking toward... Uh, Toward May, maybe, they'll still be doing snow sports up here on Mount Hood. Reporting live in government camp, Jim Hyde, the 10 o'clock news. And the question on the minds of a lot of people living around here is, does all this rain really help our drought situation at all? Chief Meteorologist Mark Nelson joins us with some answers on that. Mark? Yeah, you know, any rain would help when we've had as bad of a winter as what we have seen. But, boy, we have caught up in just a few days here. Here are the numbers. I just updated them with, within the last hour. 3.6 inches of rainfall so far this month at Portland. That's above normal for the first time in months. And in fact, that is the wettest month that we've had since December. And that's wetter than both January and uh, February combined. Now, the really good news, the rain has really been hitting the mountains. And of course, now it's changed to snow. Detroit Lake, one of our many reservoirs that give us water for the summertime. Well, on Friday, it was 1,488 feet, 1,488 feet. Now it's 18 feet higher in just three days. That, that entire lake filled up 
18 feet. So that's an incredible amount of water. Most of that has been captured. In fact, out of every 10 gallons of water coming in, the Army Corps of Engineers only letting one out. So lots of water stacking up west side. Could be a different story east side. We'll talk about the snowpack. Still some big problems there. That's coming up in my main weather segment in just a few minutes. Okay, see you then, Mark. The next time you drive through a school zone, there is a little extra incentive for you to slow down. Portland is taking part in a national study of photo radar in school zones. The eight-week program kicked off this morning at Vernon Elementary School in Northeast Portland. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is using Portland to test the effect of photo radar on speed and safety in school zones. They also want to gauge the public's opinion on photo radar enforcement. And parents we talked to like the idea. Any tool that we have to slow down people around school so that children and their parents um, feel safer and allow their children to walk to school so we can have more children walking and biking to school. Yeah, listen to this too. It was just the first day, but already police handed out more than 40 tickets. And those citations come with a hefty price tag. They start at $391 and they top out at over $700. The 10 o'clock news is just getting started. She drove her SUV right off the Morrison Bridge. Coming up here, the 911 tapes for the first time. A killer quake rocks the same region devastated by the deadly tsunami. We've got the latest from Indonesia, including new tsunami fears. Are you getting the most you can from your tax return? We've got the deductions most people forget to take coming up. And caught on tape, a baby seal runs wild on the streets of San Francisco. Wait till you see what it took to catch him. You're watching the 10 o'clock news. First, live, local. A shocking surprise to Michael Jackson's defense team. The ruling that could have a major impact on their case coming up on the 10 o'clock news. First, live, local. People are still talking about the amazing survival of a woman whose SUV plunged over the Morrison Bridge over the weekend. Tonight, we get our first chance to hear the frantic 911 calls witnesses made for help. The calls ranged from calm. 911. Uh, yes, I'm standing on the Hawthorne Bridge, and a car just went into the river. To panicked. Hey, somebody just went over the Morrison Bridge in the car. There's people in the water. We need a cop down here now. An ambulance fire department now. Morrison Bridge. The Morrison Bridge. Okay, someone Morrison jumped into the water. No, they came off the side in a car. Witnesses were horrified when they saw Melissa Borgard's SUV lose control and crash through the guardrail. It headed nose first into the Willamette, but Melissa managed to unbuckle her seatbelt and climb through a broken window. She floated in the water while bystanders yelled their support. Somebody's coming! Stay on your back! He said he was on his back. He's on his back. His head's up. Heads up. Heads up. Heads up. He's still alive, but he's out in the middle of the river. Did you see anyone else in the car? No, the car's in the water, dude. It stink like a rock. But Melissa stayed afloat until help arrived, first onto a rescue boat, then onto a stretcher. Amazingly, she ended up with just minor cuts and bruises. I don't know how it happened, and since it happened, I don't know how I ever came out of it, you know, basically okay. <laughs> At least some of the credit belongs to some heroes with cell phones. Okay, all right, we got help on the way. Thanks for calling. People cheered as Melissa was pulled from the river. Tonight, her SUV is still at the bottom of the Willamette. Well, there was a lot more security for some local students back in school this week. Today, Hillsboro police showed up at Glencoe High following the arrest of four students. Police say the four shot up the home of a classmate two weeks ago. Bullets tore through windows and walls at the home on Northeast Parkside Drive, but no one was hurt. Today, the district sent home a letter to help reassure parents and kids that their school was a safe place to be since many kids only heard about the shootings through the rumor mill. I thought it was pretty stupid of them because I heard they're going to go to jail for a long time. They're still really young, so it kind of messes up their life. 18-year-old Matthew Pettit and the three others now face charges for attempted murder. The investigation is still on tonight into a window-smashing spree in Vancouver. Today, police identified two young men they say shot out around 1,000 windows since October. Detectives say Jason Willen and also Christopher Anderson used a wrist rocket to shoot ball bearings through cars and homes in the area since last October. As of tonight, the two are not under arrest since the investigation is still underway. Tonight, an Eagle Creek man is in the hospital after a fire left his body severely burned. Wade Webb was working in his garage in an old Jeep when some gasoline dripped from the tank, hit a light bulb and exploded. You can see the huge hole left in the house. Well, the father of two ran out of the garage and tried to get his wife and kids out of the living room. Webb suffered burns to 80% of his body. 
A big anniversary today for one of our volcanoes here in the Northwest. It was exactly 25 years ago today. Mount St. Helens had its first steam explosion in 123 years. That preceded the deadly blast in May of 1980. Scientists say in the past few days there have been eight large quakes on the mountain, and that could be because of all the water seeping down there with almost eight inches of rain that they've had up there since Saturday. Tonight, good news about our local economy. Things are looking up. New numbers from the Oregon Employment Department show Portland area employers added 7,300 new jobs in February. That's a jump of 3% from this time last year. State economists say most of those jobs are in manufacturing and high tech. It is getting tougher for minors to buy alcohol with fake IDs in Oregon. That's because businesses are getting much better at spotting the fakes. The OLCC says stores and restaurants confiscated more than 1,800 fake IDs last year. That's up from 1,200 the year before. Officials credit their success to a campaign that made spotting the phonies a top priority. In news from around the Northwest tonight, a day in science class turns into a fiery horror show in Seattle. Tonight, staff at the middle school are trying to figure out what happened earlier today. So far, all they know is that a flammable liquid caught fire and splashed on a 14-year-old girl, causing second and third degree burns to her hands, arms, and shoulders. Students are in shock after what started as a typical day. And then I hear a scream and um, this girl comes running through the classroom and she's on fire and she's running towards me. Well, the school says the teacher was so upset a substitute is now filling in for her and the victim may need some plastic surgery. She could, though, be back to school in just a few weeks. AIDS activists are up in arms over a proposal to have public health officials in Washington come to your house to warn you that you've been exposed to HIV. Before it was up to doctors to talk to HIV patients about warning their partners themselves, then public health officials would step in only as a last resort. Well, the Department of Public Health will decide whether or not to adopt that new plan next month. A warning tonight about a young man who's been scamming people in Shoreline with a bogus tale about a soccer fundraiser. Neighbors say the 18-year-old goes door to door saying he's selling magazines to raise money for a soccer trip to London. When questioned, he gives out names and details, but all the information he provides is phony, and the company's internet address is not even a real website. In Puyallup, Washington, you know, it wouldn't be Easter without a spring peep fling. Peep chuckers in Washington State came out yesterday for the annual contest. Contestants used a spatula to fling peeps into strategically placed baskets. Uh, this is my third year doing it, yeah. And uh, I, I came all the way here from Idaho to defend my title, and. I didn't take gold, but I did take this award in the first place in the pack, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> this is the sixth year the town of Puyallup has held the contest. The winner takes home the honor of Best Peep Shooter 2005. All right, still tonight we have a major court ruling in the Michael Jackson case to tell you about. Yeah, it was a big hit for the defense team today. We'll have the new development in the King of Pops fight against molestation charges. Also ahead, Iraqi women are taking back control of their lives and careers, but the newest trend is causing some concern for people. We'll tell you why ahead. And tax time is sneaking up on us. We'll tell you about some deductions that you may have forgotten about. And late this afternoon, the radar looked like things were all quiet. Didn't you notice it was looking kind of dry? Well, that's changed quickly this evening. A brand new storm. This one is a cold one, and the wind is blowing out there tonight as well. We'll let you know how long the stormy weather will continue and how low that snow level is going to go coming up. You're watching the 10 o'clock news. First, live, local. Still tonight, see what makes the Fox 12 final cut, including a cabbie who got in way over his head. The river rescue caught on tape. Also making the most out of your tax deductions, new options you may not know about. And he's no stranger to TV, why this famous face made a special trip to Oregon. Plus everything else you need to know tonight on the Fox 12 final cut. Michael Jackson's defense team got quite a surprise today. The judge in the King of Pops child molestation trial says previous allegations of molestation can be entered into court. KPTV's Adam Housley has the story. The biggest day in the case against Michael Jackson thus far. Comedian George Lopez has finished his testimony. He's the first of what expected to be a long line of celebrities. But the day didn't begin with Lopez. It began with a setback for the defense. 
Despite a staunch protest from Jackson defense attorney Thomas Mesero, the judge in the Michael Jackson child molestation trial ruled the prosecution may present testimony about past allegations of sexual misconduct against the one-time king of pop. The defense is going to argue the kids aren't here because they deny it happened. If the defense is clever in this case, they'll actually get before the jury the fact that those alleged victims deny anything even happened. The allegations involve five boys, including two who reached multi-million dollar civil settlements with Jackson. One accuser from a 1990 case will testify, and Judge Rodney Melville will also allow testimony from third-party witnesses who allegedly have knowledge of the cases. Uh, the only thing worse for the defense would have been if the alleged victims themselves were willing to come in and testify. Obviously, one of them, the most infamous one, is not willing to testify in the case. That allows the defense to argue they're not willing to because it's not true. Included in the new ruling, the possibility third parties will testify about an alleged inappropriate relationship between child star Macaulay Culkin and Jackson. Culkin has maintained all along no molestation ever occurred. Also, third party witnesses from the most infamous case, the 1993 case against Michael Jackson, which was settled out of court and subsequently a new law was passed here in California. The mother will take the stand, but the accuser, Jordy Chandler, is out of the country and will not testify. In Santa Maria, California, Adam Housley, Fox News. Well, Michael Jackson's former bodyguard is expected to testify in the pop star's case, but right now he's dealing with his own legal battles. Christopher Carter was in a Las Vegas courtroom today. He's facing kidnapping and robbery charges after being arrested in February. Carter worked with Jackson for a year, and he's expected to testify that he saw Jackson and his accuser drink wine out of a Coke can. But legal experts say the serious charges against Carter could taint his credibility with jurors. We've been hearing about the snowy weather. We even saw some a little mm -hmm. bit earlier in our newscast around here. Yeah, Mark, what does it mean for driving conditions up in the mountains over the next few days? Well, remember, at the end of March, normally we'd be looking at much warmer conditions. Yeah, we might get a snowstorm here and there, but that's about it. But tonight, different story. Boy, the snow is falling in the mountains. And remember, studs have to be off in just a few days here, but you'll need them tomorrow, maybe in a few spots. It's below freezing up there. Now, coming up, we'll let you know how low that snow is going to go and how much more soaking rain we'll get here. Thousands are feared dead tonight following a devastating earthquake in Indonesia. We will take you to the area hit by the 8.7 magnitude quake just ahead. Some terrifying moments for L.A. police and a man who climbed a tree, how this situation ended. And we will have a live report from tonight's Portland School Board meeting. Members are deciding whether to make a high school 7th through 12th grade. You're watching the 10 o'clock news. First, live, local. Some tax advice for those of you selling stuff on eBay. Details coming up on the 10 o'clock news. First, live, local. The fight for Iraq tonight leaves three people dead. A roadside bomb exploded near a police patrol in southern Baghdad. Those killed in the attack included a policeman and two civilians. Meanwhile, another explosion over the weekend rocked a shopping district in northern Baghdad. That explosion damaged a number of stores, as you can see, but no one was killed in that attack. Iraqi women are taking some big steps these days by signing up for a job that they have not been allowed to hold for more than 40 years. Right now, there are 35 enrolled in the Baghdad Police Academy. Women weren't allowed to be police officers under Saddam Hussein. Before this, many of the female cadets had only worked as housewives. They even had to ask their husbands for permission to come here. My husband did not object to me coming to the academy to be a police officer, and I have three kids, but my family still did not say no. Well, as far as these women have come, they are still are not allowed to patrol on the street next to the men. When they graduate, graduate, they will be in office jobs or working security checkpoints inside buildings. Today, another deadly earthquake sent shockwaves throughout Central Asia. The quake sent thousands running for shelter and brought back memories of the deadly tsunami that struck the region just three months ago. Right now, officials believe 2,000 people died in the quake, but that number could go up. KPTV's William Lajeunesse has the latest. Just three months after that deadly tsunami hit Southeast Asia, another aftershock. 8.7 magnitude, making it the fifth most powerful earthquake in the last 100 years. Now, the death toll, however, is likely to be just a fraction of that one three months ago. It hit just about 130 miles from Sumatra. Experts say it should have taken tsunami waves just 15 minutes to hit nearby villages. However, early word has casualties comparatively light. 
U.S. experts immediately notified countries in the area. Tens of thousands evacuated along the coasts. Reports indicate the tsunami smaller and nowhere near as devastating as December's. Why? Well, a smaller magnitude quake, but also three times deeper, therefore much less powerful. The main energy beam was directed away from the mainland. It was localized. Therefore, most of the energy was dissipated as it moved along the ocean floor. Now, however, this was a very powerful quake as the dawn and the day unfolds in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia and Malaysia. Fox News crews are on the way. In Los Angeles, William Lajeunesse, Fox News. Now, many local volunteers from Mercy Corps and Northwest Medical Teams are in that region helping out tsunami victims, but both organizations say none of their people were hurt in the quake. Storm Team 12's Mark Nelson joins us now. It was uh, sunny for a brief period this morning, yeah, then brief. cloudy, then sunny again. Showers and sun breaks. It's like yeah. spring And here. some hard pouring rain. Yeah, some hard, that's too. what we'll see again tomorrow. Tonight we're getting an actual organized system. I should have yeah. taken people's... The advice I always give to people in a big long drought situation, mm -hmm. I say, hey, the rain always comes back. And yep. I didn't really believe it myself. But, <laughs> but now it I do. Yeah. It did yeah. come yeah. back. <laughs> Take a look at these uh, totals. Now, Drew showed you these last night. What I've done is added on to the last 24 hours or added on the rainfall that we had in the last 24 hours. This is basically our whole storm total since Friday night. Tillamook, five inches, just over five inches. Astoria, almost four. South Fork, that's in the coast range, a recording station there, 9.35 inches. Here in the metro area, mostly between two and three inches within the last three days. Here's Capoose getting close to four inches. Larch Mountain, the one in Washington, that's east of Battleground, almost eight inches. Mount St. Helens, there's a sensor there, about 10 inches. Also, a little over 10 inches this is in the watershed of our Bull Run, uh, our Bull Run watershed, which is where the uh, Portland water supply comes from. So that's important. We just had almost a foot of rain up there. So we're in pretty good shape here. Zigzag, uh, almost six inches. So huge amounts of rain. The showers and sun breaks today, this is about what it's going to look like again tomorrow. This is our time lapse from our river camera. Right now at a river cam, things still windy out there. It's a windy night, a kind of a rainy night as well. And those showers are going to continue, boy, pretty steady overnight and then ease off a bit during the daytime tomorrow. Officially raining them 45 at the airport. South wind, 15 miles per hour. That's our storm wind direction southerly. And the snow level just under 3,000 feet. I think that'll be down around 2,000 feet by tomorrow morning. Take a look at our pinpoint radar. You can clearly see the crest of the Cascades right here. The Cascades stop most of the moisture. You folks will get a little bit east side, but most of it stays west side. And you get the heaviest rainfall up against the coast range and also against the Cascade range. Temperatures generally in the 40s at this hour. It's down to 34 at Baker City, though. You can see on the satellite picture here, we had one little system come through this morning. That's the steady rain. Then this big curl here. This is a nice cold front. Meteorologically, kind of like these things. They mean some active weather on the way. Here's a steady rainfall for tonight. We're in a cool air mass now. Slightly colder behind it, but notice it's very broken up behind. So tomorrow, definitely one of those days, like Wayne said, where you get the showers and then you see the sunshine. Maybe a hail shower, maybe even a thunder shower. A rain and snow uh, forecast, though, notice by 2 a.m. the back edge of that cold front moves through. Scattered showers off and on all day long tomorrow. The good news, I think we get a break on Wednesday, 10 a.m. Wednesday. Notice it's mostly just snowing in the mountains. So, did we do much over the weekend snowfall-wise? This is the average at Timberline, just below Timberline. Normally, we should have about, oh, 50 inches of snowpack water by April 1st. Well, we made up a little bit, but you can see we need to make up a whole bunch more. So, this needs to continue for weeks to make any sort of significant impact for east of the Cascades, which is mostly dependent on snow water. So showers and sun breaks, coastal areas tomorrow, also here in the western valleys. Temperatures kind of chilly again, low 50s for a highs. East of the Cascades, showers and sun breaks too. A gusty west wind behind that front, gust of 45 in the gorge, maybe 40 just about anywhere else. We do have the winter storm warning up for the Cascades, a foot to a foot and a half of new snow. Uh, we all add all that up until about Wednesday morning. I think we could get that much. And our pinpoint forecast from Storm Team 12 around town. 40 in the morning, pretty solid in the morning. Breaks up in the afternoon, showers and sun breaks. About 52 for an afternoon high. So pretty much like today, pretty chilly out there. Not all that cold tonight, but if you're headed out for the bus stop in the morning, it will be chilly, only around 40. 51 at Gresham. And southwest winds even a bit breezier tomorrow, gust to 30. I mentioned Wednesday will be a bit drier. Thursday, we could actually have a dry day. Rain comes back Friday. We generally stay in this wet pattern not counting Thursday, and that includes next weekend. It looks wet both days, temperatures below normal. This time of the year, we should be getting close to 60. And remember, we're going to spring forward on Saturday night. Of course, you can get your latest forecast tomorrow morning with Andy Carson at 5. You'll relish tonight's final cut with a high dive that takes a bite out of crime. 
A prince being asked to eat some humble pie, street treats for your dog that may be the latest food trend, and a new sandwich that brought Jared all the way to Portland. You're watching the 10 o'clock news first, live, local. A close call for this cabbie. The river rescue caught on tape, plus everything else you need to know next on the Fox 12 Final Cut. The Final Cut in three, two, one, cue them. We start the final cut tonight with news across America and a 10 year old boy under arrest for trying to bring water to Terry Schiavo. Josh Heldreth says that he was too compelled by compassion to care about the consequences. He was one of six children that crossed a police line outside of Terry Schiavo's hospice in Florida. Schiavo is in her second week surviving without a feeding tube after several court appeals by her parents were denied. Jesus would do the same thing if she was dying, so I'll try to do it. Shivo's father said today that his daughter is weak but hanging on, and lawyers for Shivo's husband say that after her death, an autopsy will be done to determine the extent of brain damage. Some tense moments in L.A. as an armed suspect takes a terrifying dive, and we warn you, this video is pretty shocking. Police say the man crashed his car into a fence before scaling the tree near the Hollywood Freeway this morning. He was armed with a knife, but as rescuers tried to coax him down, he took off his shirt, and then look at that, he jumped and just came crashing to the ground. No word on whether he faces any charges tonight. In Texas, police catch a fugitive on the loose. Deputies got a tip from a woman who said the man was in her home with her bedridden husband, and he was ready to give up. The 19-year-old and one other man are wanted for car theft and firing shots at police. Police search door to door in the hopes of finding the men. The law came down our road and told everybody that was in the house as they check in to see who's there and told them to get their stuff and get out. Police are still looking for the other suspect tonight. In Syracuse, New York, the police chief stepped down less than 24 hours after being charged with hitting a pedestrian with his car while driving drunk. Officers from his own apartment, or department rather, arrested him last night. The pedestrian suffered only minor injuries and was treated at the scene. The chief had been with the Syracuse Police Department since 1972. Now the final cut, one taxi driver is lucky to be alive tonight after coming face to face with rushing water. Some great video here. Take a look. It all happened in northern Kentucky. That's where the cab was caught in a flash flood. The cab driver spent more than an hour stuck until rescuers were able to use an extension ladder from a fire truck to hover out over the cab there. Once they were close enough, they bashed in the back window with an ax. And then as you see there, they were dragging the man to safety. The driver of the cab was shaken, but he was not injured. A Texas family is in mourning tonight as their worst fears are confirmed. Searchers found the body of an 11-year-old boy near a park in San Antonio. The boy drowned as he tried to cross a spillway. At the time, his family was celebrating Easter with a picnic. At first, they didn't know what happened to the child, but a search dog was brought in, in which they found the boy's body about 500 yards from where he went into the water. A happy ending here for a toddler in Virginia who decided to take a walk around town. Someone found the boy dressed only in his pajamas last night. The person took a boy to a nearby store, then called 911. Police didn't have to wait long to find out who the toddler was. His caregiver called police just about a half hour later. No word on whether that caregiver will face any charges. The FAA is looking into three separate small plane crashes tonight. The latest happened early today in Bloomfield. That's where a plane took off from the airport, but then decided to turn back. It crashed before reaching the runway. A woman was killed in the crash. Her pilot husband is in the hospital tonight with serious injuries. The couple's son is the airport manager in Bloomfield, Iowa. Five others were killed in other crashes over the weekend. Sometimes staying at home doesn't make you any safer. Three people are in Tulsa hospitals tonight after their house exploded. The blast burned a man and his two sons, and it destroyed the house, and two others nearby were also damaged. Investigators are still looking into the blast, but say it may have been caused by a gas leak. A slippery new neighbor is off the streets of San Francisco tonight after a romp through town. Check out this baby seal who managed to get loose from Fisherman's Wharf Aquatic Park late last night. Well, people followed the lost pup all around town before the seal slid up the steps of a house. Officers eventually came up with a plan to corral the pup with a garbage can. Animal Control safely delivered the seal to the Marine Mammal Center. New York mutts are about to get their own form of food on the go. Take a look at these street treats. For just a quarter, you can get a mini dog biscuit. The pair who came up with the idea started with just one machine last year. Now the company plans to have at least 50 more out there over the next year. 
An Ohio orchestra group is playing a racy new tune to attract audiences. Check out the Canton Symphony's pinup calendar. The organization says attendance has been on the wane a little bit the past few seasons. Now the players are also posing as calendar girls. After 72 years, I get to be a glamour girl. It took me a long time to get here. <laughs> and the symphony says that they've had a great response from classical music lovers, too. Although most of the musicians say they don't plan on switching careers anytime soon. Live from Fox 12 Oregon, this is Breaking News. We want to update you on our breaking news. Right now, the Portland School Board is hard at work deciding what to do with Jefferson High School. Already tonight, the board voted to close three other local schools. KPTV's Kevin Quarry joins us now live from North Portland with more. Kevin? Well, Sean, it has been a long night. It doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. This meeting started about four hours ago, and right now, Portland Public School Board members are in a private meeting trying to come up with a new proposal for Jefferson High School. As you mentioned, they voted earlier today to close three Portland elementary elementary schools, Whitaker, Applegate, and Kenton elementary schools, but they are still debating perhaps the most contentious issue, and that is, again, what to do with Jefferson High School. Superintendent Vicki Phillips um, has proposed a plan that would make Jefferson a 7th through 12th grade school, and that was met with uh, much debate tonight. In fact, dozens of people showed up here at headquarters to voice their opinions about that plan. They are very much against that plan. The district is looking at that plan, however, because they believe it would allow for more focus on students and uh, stop students from being moved from school to school um, more often. But people voicing their opinions tonight say that it would actually make uh, less people come to Jefferson High School and would uh, cause a lot of problems in that area. Again, Portland Public School Board members in a private meeting right now trying to come up with a new plan. This is all, of course, in an effort to plug a $32 million budget shortfall. Vicki Phillips also expected later tonight to mention uh, more details about uh, an upcoming budget. In fact, we're understanding now she she is looking at a $52 million budget in the coming years and looking at uh, having to let go more than 260 full-time employees. But again, she's expected to give more details on that a little bit later on tonight. We'll have another live uh, update coming up a little bit later on in the newscast. For now, live in North Portland, Kevin Kawari, the 10 o'clock news. Just one week before baseball season starts, one Portland Little League has already suffered a big loss. Someone stole more than $2,500 worth of their field equipment. KPTV's Jamie Wilson joins us now from the Fox 12 Mobile Newsroom with more on that. Well, volunteer coaches with this Southeast Portland League say the stolen equipment was old, but it worked, and it was all they had. Over the weekend, someone broke into this storage shed that belongs to the Babe Ruth Baseball League. Volunteers can't imagine how the thieves broke through such a heavy-duty lock, but they took the league's pitching machine, their lawnmower, and their gas-powered edger. They've been ripped off before, but with more than 100 kids ready to play baseball just days before the season is supposed to start, league managers say this one is tough to take. You know, it's a lot of hard work, and it's all gone, so... But we'll, we, we will survive. Uh, I won't let this get to our league. Now, those league managers did fill out a report about the theft, but if you have any information for them, call the Portland Police Department. In the Fox 12 Mobile Newsroom tonight, Jamie Wilson, the 10 o'clock news. Okay, the deadline for sending in your 2004 tax returns is approaching fast, but tonight we have some tips for both the overly reserved taxpayers and for those of you who take those creative deductions. You have receipts for those. Yes, of course. Ask any tax preparer and they'll tell you it's all about the deductions. Frequently, the biggest mistake people make are not taking deductions they're entitled to. They think, oh my God, I don't want the IRS to be concerned about my tax return. Well, the tax code gives you the ability to take things off and it's up to you to take it. Getting all the deductions you're entitled to can make a big difference between facing a tax bill and getting a refund. Start by researching some of the new deductions, like the Shopaholics Delight. This year, for the first time, you'll have the option of deducting the sales tax you've paid this year if it's more than you paid out in state and local income tax. Unfortunately, that won't help us much in Oregon with no sales tax. The big benefit goes to people who live in the seven states with no tax on earned income. Florida, Nevada, Alaska, South Dakota, Washington, Texas, and Wyoming. Also new this year, if you gave to the tsunami relief effort as late as January 31st, then you're entitled to claim that contribution on your 2004 return. And don't overlook situations which could save you a bundle. For example, if you're a single parent, consider filing as the head of household. You'll pay less in tax. And if you're working from home, 
The home office deduction can be very valuable if it's claimed correctly. The home office has to be, though, the part of your house that you use for business and you use it regularly and exclusively for business. So it can't be like your guest bedroom. But remember, if you claim something you're not entitled to, it's you who'll pay the price. I just saw someone come in who had children on their return that they never had, who actually filed a joint return with someone that they weren't married to. And you look at it and you say, what are you doing? Well, the fact is people have to understand if you're taking illegal deductions and you know what's going on, you're responsible. Okay, so what are the odds that you'll actually be audited by the IRS? Well, the chances are not good. Experts say your chances are about one half of 1%. Hey, if you're making some extra cash on eBay, we have some advice about declaring that income. The IRS says income generated from online auctions can be taxable. The difference depends on whether the items are sold or part of a business or not. The IRS can apply a list of nine indicators that might prove whether someone's online auctions amount to a business. For more details on the tax implications, check out the links on our website, kptv.com. Well, there are some people in England who say Prince Charles, Charles needs to make one apology before he marries Camilla Parker Bowles. A church bishop says Charles has to atone for committing adultery and for breaking up Camilla's marriage to Andrew Parker Bowles. He says the apology should come before the wedding. The bishop didn't say whether the apology should be in person or not. A spokesman for Prince Charles is not commenting on the issue. Hollywood is buzzing tonight about the death of a musician. Paul Hester, who was the drummer of the pop band Crowded House, hanged himself in Australia over the weekend. Hester's body was found Saturday in a park near his Melbourne home. Crowded House was one of Australia's most successful bands in the late 80s and 90s with hits like Don't Dream, It's Over. Paul Hester was 46 years old. Well, the man who puts Subway on the map makes the final cut tonight. The one and only Jared was in town today to talk about a brand new sandwich made with Northwest ingredients. We have a brand new Subway sandwich we're trying today. It's the Smokehouse Salmon Sub, and we would like you to try it. Yeah, the Smokehouse Salmon Select won the top spot in the Northwest Fresh Sandwich Contest. Features smoked salmon naturally, plus cheddar cheese and also veggies. William Knight from Portland came up with the winning recipe. That's him right there that you see on the left. And the people who tried it had to agree with the judges. It's excellent. I was really surprised, you know, to have the salmon in there. It's really good. I like it. It is wonderful. You know, smoked salmon is one of my favorite things, and I've only had it on crackers, so <laughs> this is a great change. Yeah, I really like it. Uh, there's Jared right there in the middle, and uh, Michael's prize is a weekend getaway to Skamania Lodge, plus a year's worth of sandwiches from Subway. And that's tonight's Fox 12's Final Cut. I'm Tim Becker, winning two games in a row. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? But it's also something the Blazers haven't done since they fired Maurice Cheeks. Alley oh. reverse layoff, Travis Outlaw. They had a chance to do that tonight, hosting the Washington Wizards, and I'll tell you if they succeed after the break. You're watching the 10 o'clock news, first live local. Mother Nature was the dominant force at this weekend's Players' Championship. We'll tell you who battled today's windy weather to end up on top. Coming up on the 10 o'clock news, first live local. Welcome back. We have said for weeks the Blazers are out of the playoffs, but that wouldn't be completely accurate. Not until they lost their next game, and that would be tonight against Washington. So you could say they were fighting for their playoff lives, gang. Travis Outlaw had a big game Saturday night against the Knicks, and boy, he was slamming away again tonight. Blazers up 25-19 there. His best effort, though, right here, second quarter, Sebastian Telfair fitting Outlaw for the reverse alley-oop. He scored 11 tonight. Blazers shot 65% the first quarter, but then fell back to reality after that. Check out this exchange. End of the half, that was Larry Hughes for the 10-point lead. Other end, Darius Miles pulls up, beats the buzzer. He scored 13 of his 15 before halftime, but it was catch up the rest of the way. Hughes slamming a fourth, making it 99-87. Wizards, but again, a few positives for the Blazers. Richie Fromm was one of them tonight. He was 6 of 7 shooting from the floor. He finished with 16 points in 18 minutes. And Telfair put up 17 points, but it is another loss, 114-106, which, by the way, officially now and mathematically eliminates Portland from the playoff hunt. Well, Phoenix has the best record in the NBA, but Denver had them against the ropes, up 107-102 after the Earl Boykins layup. Carmelo Anthony paced the Nuggets with 22, snaps a 107 all-tie, but came up limping, and Denver's game fell apart after that. Joe Johnson scored eight of the Suns' final 13 points. 
to help them pull away. And like his team, uh, George Carl fell apart too, getting all up in a ref's face there. Carl got booted. His team's six-game winning streak ended with a 123-114 loss in Phoenix. A couple top college players, I thought I was going to say cop college players, say they're leaving school early to enter the NBA draft. Utah center Andrew Bogut uh, hired an agent, so he can't go back to school no matter what. Different situation, though, for the Pac-10 player of the year, Ike Diagu. The Arizona State junior made himself eligible for the draft, but he did not hire an agent, so he can return to ASU if he decides not to go pro. Of course, the rest of the Pac-10 would love to see him go. He led the conference in both scoring and rebounding last season. Well, six more days now till the regular season opens for the Mariners, who are making everybody forget that Ken Griffey Jr. ever played for him. Yesterday, Ichiro broke Jr.'s spring training hit streak record. Today, Raul Ibanya shot down another one of Jr.'s achievements, driving in four runs against the Cubbies. That one there for the 3-1 lead. But bottom of the first, the Cubs get them all back. It was tied 3-3. After just one inning right there. Top five, Seattle breaks out of a four all time. Miguel Olivo with a two run single. That made it seven to four Mariners. Cubs tied it again at seven, but top of the ninth, there's Ibanez collecting two more of those RBIs. And four in the game gives him 26 this spring, most ever by a Mariner. They beat the Cubs 11 to seven. Golfers finally uh, finished the weather delayed players championship, but today's windy conditions jerked a lot of them around out there, especially on the par three 17th Island Green. That's Tiger Woods finding the water on the way to a three over 75. He was nowhere near the leaders. This is Phil Mickelson's shot on 17. Same deal, a three over 75. He finished the event tied for 40th. Fred Funk not only hit the green on 17, he also sank that par putt on 18 to secure the lead at nine under par for the tournament. And that holds up after Luke Donald misses is the birdie right here to tie. Misses is the birdie to tie. And that leaves Funk all alone to celebrate as well he should. Top prize money, $1.44 oh. million dollars for one tournament. Oh. It's the richest one out there. Nice. Oh, all right, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Tim. Hey, it's looking a lot like Oregon out there lately. Mark, we'll have a look at the rainy forecast. That's coming up in the 11 o'clock headlines. Plus, we'll have another live update on the vote to shut down Portland schools. You're watching the 10 o'clock news first live local live from Fox 12 Oregon. This is breaking news tonight. We've been following the decision to shut down more Portland schools and already tonight the board has decided to close three local schools. The fate of Jefferson High still up in the air. KBTV's Kevin Quarry is live in North Portland. That's right, When we're still waiting for a decision on Jefferson High School. In fact, board members are still debating it inside headquarters right now. As far as closures go, earlier tonight they did uh, vote to close Whitaker, Applegate, and Kenton Elementary Schools. As far as Jefferson High School, the superintendent wants to make that a 7th through 12th grade schools. Board members want to assign a team to look into that idea and then report back in December. Again, we are waiting on a decision, and we will have the very latest tomorrow morning on Good Day Oregon. For now, live in North Portland, Kevin Kawari, the 10 o'clock news. We're also following some breaking news out of Southeast Portland. Police are on their way to a shots fired call. It happened just a few minutes ago at Southeast 113th and Boise. We have a crew on the way. We will bring you the very latest tomorrow on Good Day Oregon. Mark, more rain for us? Yeah, rainy, windy night out there. Kind of like Saturday night, right? Mm. Well, tomorrow, though, showers and sun breaks. And what else do you see there? Rain. On Tuesday? Oh, oh. Some thunderstorm yeah. there, maybe. Wow. Might see some thunder. Just, you know, it's at springtime, April, May. When we're almost mm -hmm. to April. Get a thunderstorm or maybe hail shower. We had one on the east side today, so it could happen tomorrow. But we'll see the sun shining between in a cool day, low 50s. Wednesday and Thursday, kind of a break, and then back to the solid rain Friday. And that would include the weekend, too. And remember, we spring forward this weekend, Saturday Already. night. Already? Yeah. I don't think this and weather. The rain is still here. <laughs> and I don't think the weather's doing much for Wayne's voice. Yeah. You need to go home and take care of that tonight. Yeah, I have to do something. <laughs> you need to relax. <laughs> All right, thanks, Mark. And thanks for joining us, everybody. For the very latest news, weather, traffic, and sports, you're going to want to check out Good Day Oregon from 5 to 9 tomorrow morning, right here on Fox 12. And we'll see you right back here tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Have a good night. Thank you for watching the 10 o'clock news on Fox 12 Oregon. Rated the number one primetime newscast in the country. And for overnight developments, wake up to Good Day Oregon tomorrow morning. Your first live and local source for news, weather, and traffic from 5 to 9.